On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled, Keeping Patients Safe, Conducting Risk Assessments, and Developing Risk Strategies in Behavioral and Non-Behavioral Environments. My name is Kelly Gibson, and I will be your moderator for this program. <clears throat> now I would like to introduce our speaker for the webinar. Carol Van Dyel has been the Director of Behavioral Health Regulatory Compliance Accreditation at UPMC Western Psychiatric Hospital for the past eight years. In addition to her role in regulatory, Carol oversees patient safety risk management, patient relations, and patient experience at UPMC Western Psychiatric Hospital. Carol has worked closely with many UPMC hospitals to ensure their knowledge of ligature risk requirements and has been actively involved with conducting risk assessments in emergency departments, critical care, and medical units. Carol, I will now turn the program over to you. Thanks, Kelly. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to, first of all, thank all, the, all of you who chose to make hearing about risk assessments a part of your day when there's so much else happening in our world. But even during the pandemic, we must all, forward, we must all move forward with the, the, with the safe care of our patients. I do want to talk just a little bit about, you know, the impact that COVID has had on what we're doing at this point in time. So COVID certainly has had a unique impact on Medicaid and psychiatric, medical and psychiatric hospitals in regard to the environment. Medical has faced um, having to treat patients at risk for suicide who are positive for COVID and managing the risk to the patients as well as to the staff tasked with providing the one-on-one -on -one observation. We've also seen a stoppage of, con of construction in both the medical and psychiatric um, with the worry of how will we be surveyed by the Joint Commission uh, is being felt by many. The financial impact of COVID has had the potential to cause rippling effects as well for months to come, which will impact our facility's ability to make the needed environmental changes required to keep behavioral health patients safe. We do know the Joint Commission has suspended surveys <clears throat> through May 31st with no guidance around ligature or environmental updates during COVID or what to expect past COVID. So I hope that what we'll talk about today will at least give you some sense about what I believe will be the continued expectation for behavioral health and medical um, facilities as they treat patients. The objectives today are to identify environmental risks of suicide in safety in hospitals, identify measures to mitigate ligature risk, and identify ways to increase staff confidence in treating the behavioral health patient. So why is there so much focus on risk assessment? Because an organization that cannot mitigate, that cannot mitigate what they are aware of within their own physical environment, in order to be able to mitigate and keep patients safe, we must know what risks exist. The Joint Commission has said and reported that suicide is among the top five sentinel events being reported to them. Um, there is a national concern about the numbers of suicides in hospitals. So research has shown that many suicide attempts are impulsive, and we certainly see that even here in our own behavioral health hospital. They're not typically planned out, but rather, a or rather an impulsive act because of a bad phone call, because of a bad interaction, a fight with another patient, um, you know, just their depression or anxiety, and finding items in the environment for self-harm becomes our biggest risk. The Zero Suicide Campaign has also set a new bar to eliminate suicides in healthcare facilities. A system-wide organizational commitment to safer suicidal care is part of that, looking at suicide deaths for individuals under the care of health and behavioral health systems that are preventable, a systemic approach to quality improvement. Um, I did include the Zero Suicide um, website, um, and it, that has the seven essential elements of suicide care. The Joint Commission does support the journey to suicide, and on the Joint Commission um, webpage is both the journey to suicide, zero suicide for hospitals, and this past year they added one for behavioral health as well. The Joint Commission uh, focused on suicide. It can be found in the National Patient Safety Goal 115.01.01. And as you look through that, there's information that is there for both psychiatric hospitals and psychiatric units within general hospitals, but also for non-psychiatric units in general hospitals. The requirement is that the hospital must conduct an environmental risk assessment that identifies features in the physical environment 
that can be used to attempt suicide, and then we have to take um, action to mitigate those risks. For non-psychiatric hospitals, in general, non-psychiatric units in general hospitals, the organization has to implement procedures to mitigate risk. They do not have to make um, changes to the overall environment, but they must identify the objects that could be used for self-harm or in, and be able to remove those items when a patient has been identified for as high risk for suicide. So what are we learning? We're learning that the number of behavioral health patients presenting to emergency departments has been continually increasing. We also have learned that medical staff really don't get much training to treat behavioral health patients. That's not the field they chose to go into. We also know that there's lots of risks in medical rooms. We also know that there's also a lack of consideration of risk being brought into a patient room by visitors and that we don't typically utilize the one-to-one, -one, which has led to events or suicide attempts in medical hospitals. So if, at this point, we see, we're certainly seeing an uptick in the number of behavioral health patients that are presenting to emergency departments, not necessarily going in and saying that they're having a behavioral health issue, that they're feeling suicidal, but really identifying their medical issues. And in the meantime, though, they are experiencing a behavioral health concern. Um, so being able to identify that particular risk and know that when a patient is at risk for suicide while in the hospital, being able to then take action to keep them safe and medical is an important is an important process. What is the risk assessment? I would say that probably for most psychiatric hospitals, they are aware of that, and I'm finding that more and more medical hospitals also are aware of what a risk assessment is. But what I see is a vast difference between the types of risk assessments that are being done, and that is certainly being identified by the Joint Commission as well. The Joint Commission is truly looking for a risk assessment that identifies all of the risks that may exist, both within psychiatric facilities as well as in medical, identifying what those particular items are and what the plan is to mitigate that risk. So looking at things like structures or fittings, which could be used in suicide by hanging or strangulation, objects that might be in the way of observing high-risk patients, identifying potential ligatures, things that could be used, identifying other risks for self-harm or suicide in the environment. <clears throat> Medical areas, as I said earlier, are not expected to be ligature-resistant environment. However, what I am finding is that in a lot of medical hospitals, they've identified one or two rooms that they're considering to be behavioral health rooms. So when they get that patient who is at high risk for suicide, and for some hospitals utilizing them for all behavioral health patients, and they're not used by medical. So if a space is considered designated for behavioral health, they are then expected to be ligature resistant. Um, and that is out new from the Joint Commission this year. When conducting a risk assessment, I think it's important to have a really consistent tool to identify a team that who could be involved, can look at infection provision, facilities, nursing, non-nursing folks who, because multiple eyes on the environment make a huge difference. What one person sees, another person might not. When I'm in medical EDs and in um, inpatient units, um, for medical, I often hear people go, wow, I would have never thought of that being a ligature risk. Risk assessments need to be not only the initial one, but to be ongoing. Thinking that one risk assessment does it forever um, does, it, does not account for the amount of equipment or other risks that might be added into, a, into an ED room or into a medical room. Here, we do risk assessments on a biannual basis, or I'm sorry, semi-annual basis, but it's also part, we also add them to daily rounds. So we're really looking at it on a daily basis. And then it's also looking at what is the risk? You know, what is that specific risk? So in EDs, we often see a lot of tubing and the overhead lights. We see a lot of medical equipment and being able to identify, you know, that those are a potential risk for suicide for patients. Um, and then what are we gonna do about it? Because we know we're not gonna remove all those items. We, can't, we cannot remove medical equipment that is um, a, attached to the walls. We're not going to remove medi um, medical beds, those sorts of things, but we can look at what potential interventions. And then being able to really educate staff 
um, and on what the risks are and what the mitigation is. And then being, being able to test the processes that get put in place. One of the things I often say to folks when I'm um, doing risk assessment rounds, and I do a lot of environmental risk assessments for hospitals, is I'll say to them, so when did you test this process? They'll talk with me about what they've done, and we move, remove these things. We talk about education, about forms they have. And when I ask them, that, they'll say, well, we haven't. And I say, okay, well, let's test your process. And what we find is that folks can't speak to it or it's not happening. Um, and so it's really important to be testing the process and make sure the things that you've put into place are working. It's the easiest way to find out whether or not um, you're going to pass the Joint Commission, quite honestly, by keeping patients safe, is by testing your own processes before they do that. <clears throat> this is an example of the risk assessment we use here at Western Psychiatric Hospital. Um, so we utilize, put in the date we did it, and the date we would reassess it, assess it um, what our issues, concerns, risks might be, and it might be something like, um, we identified holes that are large in a ceiling vent that where a shoestring could be looped through that. It could be we identified that we have a pullout chair in one of our areas for patients who can't sleep in a bed because this is our crisis area um, that it has a loop that pulls the, the chair out. And so it's actually loop that it creates a really strong potential for tying something off. Um, and then we look at things like um, in medical, it would be, um, all the tubing um, that, that lays around. It might be the excess numbers of gloves. It's not unusual for me to go into an ED or medical unit, and there may be six or seven boxes of gloves. Um, and my question always is, the gloves are important, absolutely, for taking care, but do we need that many boxes? Is it possible to look at reducing that? It only takes about, um, in my testing, of about four or five gloves tied together to create a really nice, solid um, ligature. And then we look at, you know, what, is, what are the actual considerations? Is this needed for care or is it not needed for care? And if it's not needed for care, then what can we do? What are the recommendations? Things like developing the list of all of those items that can be removed that are not necessary for care. So oftentimes I see things like, you know, two or three pillows, multiple sheets, um, as I said, the gloves, other kinds of things like that. Can we take those out of the room um, you know, so, since they're not needed for care, and then put them back in when we have the medical patient. Um, can, are we going to teach and, and educate folks on what are those item, items? Um, will it be done for during handoff? You know, so you may have somebody who's in there who's at high risk for suicide. You have them with a sitter. If the sitter's going to take a break, they're going to go to lunch. And so another sitter comes down. Is that sitter then informed about what those items were so they know whether or not something has been added into the environment? Looking at things like food trays that come in. Are they coming in with a regular hospital tray or are they getting a psych safe tray? Um, are they getting finger foods or do they have silverware? Is the silverware plastic or is it metal? And whether it's plastic or metal, do we know that three three utensils came in and the three utensils go back out. Again, thinking about that patient who's at most risk for suicide. And that then becomes the, taking those recommendations and that becomes the plan for the prevention, correction, and mitigation. For most medical, we know that they're not gonna go through and, and get rid of all those items, but they are gonna be able to talk about the education that they're gonna provide to the staff, the monitoring they're going to do, how they're going to round on it, what practices will they put in place when dietary comes in or x-ray comes in or somebody else comes in? How are they informed? Um, will the patient be going to testing with a one-on-one? -on -one? Um, those sorts of pieces. And then the steps and actions are what did we actually do? So when did the training happen? Who did it, who did it occur with? When did the psych safe trays get implemented? And then update resolution would be that if something did get changed in a room, so for example, we, some of our medical units are changing out doorknobs from the rounded doorknobs or those that have that slight curvature that create the opportunity to tie something off, they're replacing those. So was that done? And if it was, that gets put into the update resolution column. Um, so that's, the, that's our typical risk assessment. Um, I do see varied, varied um, additions of this across lots of medical. 
Um, it, there's not one that's wedded that anybody's wedded to, not one that I wedded to. I like this one because I think that not because we've developed it, we actually took it from multiple places, but I think it gives a pretty clear picture. The VA certainly has some of their own um, as well. There's lots of resources um, if you're interested in, in looking at others. So these, this is a picture of some of the risks that get identified um, in medical that I've looked at. Um, so the curtains, the curtain rod, the curtain hooks, the little hook above the light is a great tie-off. And even though that piece typically comes down, it still offers a really nice tie-off for somebody, whether they're using their bed sheet, their bed clothing, the call bell cord, the nurse call cord, whatever it happens to be. Um, you can see that the remote control, I've identified that as a risk as well. Those are great things to be able to break open and take that plastic and be able to cut themselves with. The tie-off on the hospital bed, um, the tie-off on the medical equipment where the oxygen and other things like that go. Um, thinking about, uh, you know, what the, what's the access to the bulbs like? You know, is that just a thin plastic that covers the bulbs? And can somebody, one, break the plastic, and two, then have access to the bulbs? Um, that table, although it's not identified, that little night table has C handles, that meaning that they look like a C hook um, and, and uh, hooked onto the, the night table. That becomes a really nice ligature risk as well, a place to tie something off on. Here's a traditional bathroom that I see in medical. Um, you can see that I, I identified the um, grab bars, which we know all medical EDs and hospitals have. A tie-off to a grab bar is probably one of the best things that you could utilize. Obviously not you, but it, people can utilize because you can tie something off pretty easily. The Joint Commission, interestingly, although it points to that toilet seat, the Joint Commission has, has took that away probably about 12 to 16 months ago where they decided that a toilet seat in and of itself did not create a ligature risk. Um, it does create a weapon risk depending on the type, of toilet, the type of toilet seat it is. The plumbing itself, though, um, creates a huge risk. Whether or not the, light, the um, electrical sockets are the safe sockets, thinking about uh, the um, paper towel holder or the towel disposer, those things have secure things that are tied to, that are mounted to the wall that create that. Plus, then you also have, you know, the plastic that can be very quickly broken and create like a shiv to be able to cut themselves with. The plastic bag, both in terms of cup, putting it over their head, but even more so being able to tear it and wrap it around uh, their neck. Here's another picture. Uh, again, you can see the C handles on those cupboards. Um, the, sink, the sink faucets are great ligatures. It doesn't take much to tie something around one of those, loop it around your neck, and right in front of the cabinet, drop down. The drain, I see that in a lot of the drain um, cover. I see that in a lot of um, emergency departments and medical. Those can create a really nice weapon, but at the same time, they're great. They have a, a sharp edge. Then they're, they're a great use for people being able to cut themselves. Again, you see the um, soap dispenser and the paper towel dispenser there. A couple more pictures. So these are the gloves I talk about, four boxes. Sometimes I've seen as many as 10 boxes, the, as I said, the gloves. Easy thing for a patient to take, especially if they're not being monitored, or we know that a human error can happen during, monitor, during observations as well. Those metal, those metal brackets are oftentimes very secure to a wall. Uh, the sharps container, um, the, the uh, sanitizer container uh, 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 bracket as well. TVs have, uh, have tremendous um, arms and that are welded, that are not, that are secure into the wall, and then all the cords that go along with those. All those place, all those pieces, can really create that tie-off for ligature, and, and pose huge risks in the medical area. We don't see much of this at all in behavioral health, but we certainly see a tremendous amount of this in EDs, um, ICUs, and general medical units. 
this is this is probably one of my favorite pictures because this is exactly how I always see cords when I go into medical. Um, and when I look at those cords, I think, oh my gosh, that is like probably one of the scariest things for me um, because of the the length of the cords, how the strength of the cords. And again, you have a tremendous ability there with a tie off both to the bed, to the piece of medical equipment. Um, for folks to be able to, you know, harm themselves. And again, thinking about whether or not, um, you know, our staff trained, do folks recognize that these are all potential risks? Are we going to remove those? We're certainly not going to remove the monitor. Um, that, that is going to be secured. It's going to be staying. But if a behavioral health patient is in there and they are not in need of that equipment, and we do know that they're at moderate or high risk or even low risk for suicide, do we need all the courting? And oftentimes what I find is, yeah, you know what, we really don't need it. So it is possible to unplug that courting and remove it from the room. The same thing as if you see in the back, there's a bag full of plastic tubing. Um, there's, um, I don't know if it's in this picture, but there's bamboo bags. I see all those as well. Again, if we don't need that for the care of the patient, it's important to create that list and make sure that's one of those things that gets removed from the room. The telephone um, as well, thinking about the telephone being able to be, but be broken, the cording on the telephone. We certainly want behavioral health patients to have the ability to talk with their loved ones, their support folks, but can we make a, make a different decision? Can we remove that telephone and bring the telephone in when they want to make a phone call? And I'm talking about for those folks who are at high risk for suicide. Uh, because it's not that you're not allowing that to happen, you're just creating a different option, different mitigation for how you're going to manage that risk. And again, thinking about having that one-to-one -one trained sitter is extremely important um, so that they're aware of all those things being a risk as well. Um, it's, I, I did a recently within the last, I guess it was in January, I did a risk assessment and I asked whether or not they had any suicidal patients who were getting one-to-one -one observations and the hospital told me that they did. And so I asked whether or not I could go and observe. And in both cases, um, the one-on-one -on -one was not providing the direct observation of the patient. One was sitting directly beside the patient and watching television but not watching the patient. And the second one was reading a book. Um, and so again, thinking about what can go wrong in that time frame when they are not providing the direct observation is important. Um, it seems so simple to think, well, geez, that person is sitting directly beside the patient, but if, they're, if their eyes are on the television, they're not necessarily seeing what the patient themselves is doing. Behavioral health patients mm -hmm. are very quick. Um, and we learn very fast from them. Oftentimes, the change that we make in our environment are those that unfortunately we have learned from our patients. And so that's why following those processes and really testing those processes are important. <clears throat> so I've already said about having the list of items that must be removed from medical environment that are not needed for the care of the patient. Um, you know, Western, it, not, sorry, at UPMC, lots of times I hear folks say that they use the list that's in our um, electronic medical record that talks about things like taking away pens and cell phones and um, different kinds of things like that. And those are the things that we're moving directly from the patient. What I don't oftentimes see or hear folks talk about is those items in the room that we just discussed. That is, is as important, if not more important, than the items that we're going to remove um, from patients themselves. Joint Commission requires that any patient that is deemed as high risk for suicide have one-to-one -one monitoring, continuous, and it has to be uninterrupted. Mm -hmm. They have to, the person who's providing the care, the one-to-one -one observation, must have the ability to immediately intervene, meaning if they, that if a patient begins to do something to harm themselves, to commit suicide, they have to be able to intervene. And it has to be provided by qualified, trained staff. That does not mean nursing. It means that it could be any of the staff that are identified in your hospital who, who received the training, you know, on suicide, what the behavioral health patient is like, what ligature means, uh, what their job expectations are, that's what that, that's what that typically means. 
I really recommend that rooms be as close to the, to the nurse's station as possible, um, but not near exit doors. Um, it's not been unusual where I have gotten a call or I've been at a hospital and they say, yeah, you know, we had the suicidal patient, we had them right by the nurse's door, and we didn't think about there being a, a, an exit door, and, you know, the person who was observing them um, had walked away and the patient left through the exit door. Um, that's a scary situation where you're talking about somebody who's been admitted into a hospital and it's already been identified about them being at risk for suicide. Thinking about hospital gowns, uh, lots and lots of risk with hospital gowns, the ability to tear them, to be able to take the ties and, and, so, and tie them all together. I already talked about the food trays and the utensils, patient belongings, but also visitor belongings. Um, hospitals really do support patients being able to have their visitors there for comfort and support. But oftentimes we don't think about is what is the visitor bringing in to the behavioral health patient's room? You know, for a typical medical patient, you know, their mother, their wife, whoever is going to bring their purse in and, and, all, and have all kinds of things in there. But for the behavioral health patient, we think about that a little bit differently. There was a hospital in Pennsylvania that I was involved with that had a patient who was admitted and they were in, um, in a general medical unit because they, they, had been down, they had been downgraded from ICU that had been there for a suicide attempt. His parents were, in, were with him. It was time for the father to take his pills. The mother grabbed, took the pills, put it in her hand, um, put the bottles back in the bag. The bag was sitting on the tray table and the mother and the father left the hospital room. I'm sure you can imagine what happened. The patient took the pills out of his mother's um, purse and took them. Now, the good news is the patient did survive, but that was really a near miss. Um, and, and the patient did not have a one-on-one. -on -one. The reason they didn't have a one-on-one -on -one is because the staff at that point in time on the, on the floor felt that the parents could be that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, parents, uh, other loved ones, spouses, uh, brothers, sisters cannot be the one-on-one. -on -one. They're not trained and they're not qualified staff to be able to do that. I know sometimes it is difficult in small hospitals to have the staff available to be able to do it, but, but they really must be, they must be qualified and trained. Again, thinking about the bathroom shower monitoring, I probably get the most pushback on this particular area because what I teach is that when a patient who's at high risk for suicide is going to the bathroom or shower, and the shower or the bathroom has the risk that we've talked about, they have to be one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I know there's a lot of concerns about the potential for dignity and respect being violated by doing that. But there are lots of ways to be able to enter the bathroom, certainly by explaining to the patient that their, that their care and their safety is our number one priority and being able to look down at the floor, look at an opposite quarter of the bathroom, um, various things like that to still provide some level of dignity and respect. Um, that's, that's extremely important. Most, uh, most um, events or near events that I've been involved in have happened related to bathrooms. There also has to be a solid hands-off process. The communication between the nursing staff and the care attendant who is gonna be providing the supervision, the, the um, care attendant to other care attendant, the conversation that happens with those who are coming in, like I said, dietary, pastoral care, all those sorts of pieces. And again, I really can't stress this enough, test your mitigation plan. Um, you would be surprised at the numbers of hospitals that I've gone to where we've done the test of their mitigation plans and um, they did not fall, they did not um, fall through the way, they did not follow up the way that folks thought they would be. So we've had, uh, I've had folks tell me about these emergency buttons that they have and I'll say, great, look, like, can I test this emergency button? They'll say, yeah, test it. And nobody came. Um, I was at a hospital where they talked with me about um, cameras that were in the hallways, and this is at a behavioral health facility, and I said, they said the safety monitors 24-7. I said, great, let's test it. I wrote uh, my name and my phone number on a piece of paper, and I stood for 10 minutes and with it hanging with it by the camera, and nobody came. Um, 
So again, test processes. I think that is the easiest way to know whether or not what you've put in place truly will keep your behavioral health patients safe, whether that be in medical or if it's in, or if it's in a psychiatric space. And again, remember that if the area in an ED is, is considered to be dedicated space for behavioral health, it must be treated the same as an inpatient psychiatric space. It must be ligature resistant, meaning that the bathroom, if you have a dedicated bathroom, the bathroom plumbing, um, the sink, the toilet, the grab bars, all those things have to be ligature resistant. The mirrors cannot be glass, it has to be plexiglass. Um, you know, doors have to have ligature resistant handles, they have to have continuous hinges, they have to fit the same, they have to follow the same things as an inpatient psychiatric space if you're considering it dedicated space in your emergency department. This is a mitigation example that um, happens at one of our hospitals, UPMC Chautauqua. Um, it was a really clever um, mitigation plan. It was put together in coordination with medical in the psychiatric unit there. They call it an emergency prevention cart. Um, and what they do is every time they have a behavioral health patient, <clears throat> excuse me, they utilize this cart. And what they do is in it is information regarding behavioral health, the suicidal patient, it has the list of all of the items that um, can be removed and should be removed, so the checklist. Um, it has copies of your environmental risk assessment, it, and as I said, educational information. It's on wheels. They store it when they don't have a behavioral health patient, and then when they do, they pull this cart out, um, and they put all that information, all that stuff in there. It's a really quick and easy way to get items removed from the room, and then also to make sure that the folks who are involved with the behavioral health patient that person who is most at risk for suicide has all the information at their fingertips. So there's no question about what items they should be removing out of the room. And there's also um, educational sheets for the person who is going to be providing the one-on-one -on -one around suicide and um, all those sorts of pieces. And I thought that's really clever. I've shared this with a lot of hospitals and certainly have found that several have adopted this particular process. So this is an example of some of the products that we have put in place in psychiatric units, um, not just ours, but psychiatric units um, across uh, Pennsylvania. Um, so behind this retractable door, so this would typically be a, a um, dining room area for psychiatric care, and uh, we have what's called a, a retractable garage door. It literally almost looks like a garage door. There's a keypad to the right of that, right by the phone. It's keyed in so that it can open or close based on whether or not there are patients <clears throat> in the room or not in the room. You should be able to see too that the phone itself has a very small cord. Um, the cord is uh, less than 18 inches and it's that way so that it cannot be used as something to tie around or wrap around the neck, I should say. Um, the blinds for these rooms are all encased in the windows so that the blind cords, uh, so it allows for privacy, but the cords are not accessible um, and are out of reach. All of our garbage cans, no matter the size, this is a large garbage can, but even small ones have paper bags. Um, it's probably one of our biggest challenges because obviously the paper bags can get wet, um, but it really mitigates the possibility for suffocation, um, you know, when using the, the plastic garbage bags. And we've, I certainly have recommended that a lot to our medical hospitals as well. Um, anytime you don't need to use a plastic bag, consider using um, a paper bag. We do have some EDs across the state and certainly in UPMC facilities that have moved to this garage door. So this would actually be in that area behind the hospital bed that has like the oxygen and all those other pieces of equipment, um, it's been built out and they actually drop the, that uh, garage door down when a patient who's at risk for suicide is gonna, be, is gonna be in that room. It doesn't mitigate all risks, but it really it mitigates a lot of risk. All that tubing, it really stops from having to remove all those items um, out of that care room. Um, and so a lot of places have moved, have moved to that or if they don't already have them in. And then of course we have specialized electrical stock. It covers, so you can't stick anything, it, it automatically stops the power. 
So what does mitigation look like um, in psychiatric? Well, we must be ligature resistant. Our door handles, our door frames, our door fasteners, clothing hooks, curtain rods, and pulls, um, our sink faucets, plumbing, toilet plumbing, shower controls, um, everything has to be ligature resistant. Um, there is a whole lot of product um, that's, that's in the FGI guidelines that's specific to psychiatric um, care. We actually here at Western Psych and in our larger um, psychiatric unit service line have an environmental steering committee and we look at products um, for all of our psychiatric hospitals so that if somebody identifies that there's something that they want to utilize, a different type of soap dispenser, a, a different uh, paper towel holder, um, uh, something like, you know, almost anything. We've looked at toilets and chairs and tables. Um, it actually comes to this committee first. We try to get a sample of the product to actually look at and then we look at whether or not we can destroy it, because if we can destroy it, we know that our patients can destroy it, but we look at whether or not it will be safe to add it into the environment. Um, if, we decided, if we decide that we feel like it could be a safe addition, we typically look at um, having one of our service line units, um, such as the, the uh, inpatient unit at Chautauqua, but we have many others, or one of our units here at Western Psych actually test the product. Um, and see what happens with that. And if, it's, if, it, if we have no, no near misses, no events, no concerns, nothing gets broken, then it gets approved and the committee adds it into, um, uh, into our product list. And so only those items that get into the product list can be added into the behavioral health environment. This group has um, representation from all of our, from our entire service line, plus we also have infection prevention, um, patient safety, uh, behavioral management, myself, and others who look at all of these, all of these products, plus we have lots of representation from the other hospitals themselves. We also include, on a quarterly basis, representations from facilities and CNOs and those sorts of, those sorts of folks from the other hospitals. It's really been a, a, a great resource, and I think one that's allowed us to identify safe products. It's also allowed us to really push back on companies to, for them to help develop more safer products and to make changes before we would agree upon putting their product into our environment. I think any hospital can um, look at having a similar kind of committee, and if interested, you guys can certainly reach me offline about that. I'd be happy to talk to you more about it. But there are things that get missed, um, such as the diffuser grills um, in the ceiling, gaps between toilets. Sometimes if a toilet gets mounted and it's not mounted completely flush, it creates a little bit of a space where you can actually get something to tie off in there. Paul bell cords, we don't use them here, but they do get used um, in some facilities. Um, clothing items that can be easily ripped, bed linen, um, hangers, handles on doors, cupboards, um, paper towel holders, uh, fire extinguisher cabinets, um, psych safe beds. Um, I think that's a misname because I don't think there is a psych safe bed. Um, it is safer than a traditional um, hospital bed, but there are still many, many ligature points and opportunities for self-harm, even with what's considered a psych safe bed. But I think that in, especially in behavioral health areas who have not been able to make some of the environmental changes, uh, because it's very, very expensive to do so, um, you know, replacing a doorknob, as simple as it sounds, can easily be a few hundred dollars, and if you need to replace you know, 15 or 20 of those, the amounts of money that go into creating a ligature uh, resistant environment is very, very expensive. Um, but the ultimate goal really is to keep our patients safe. So what are you going to do to keep patients safe? Um, you want to utilize an evidence-based screening tool that's including in your ED um, and on your units if you're doing screening there. Um, and then if a patient is screened um, as positive for suicide, having a uh, an evidence-based assessment tool as well in, in determining who does the screening tool. For most facilities, it's nursing, 
Uh, the assessment tool sometimes, the assessment is actually done by nursing in some areas, by physicians and others, and actually by social work in some as well. But being able to, to look at that, um, the observation le level and rounding, thinking about what you can do to make environments more ligature resistant, the patient areas, common areas, corridors, um, making sure staff are present, looking at your policies and procedures, <clears throat> thinking about, you know, when are you going to reassess patients? Uh, the staff training and competency, which I think is one of the most important pieces of what we do, um, making sure that the staff are well trained and they understand the risks, they understand the type of patient they're being seen, and then making sure that they're competent um, when engaging with a behavioral health patient, whether it be in medical or in psychiatric. Um, for psychiatric and in medical, the treatment plan or the plan of care. What's the discharge plan look like? Are they being discharged to um, a psychiatric care, whether it be another inpatient or to a, some type of an outpatient setting? Um, what, is, what does their crisis plan look like? Uh, that's being done more on a psychiatric side, but having a crisis plan that starts at the time when patients are admitted into the psychiatric unit and then making sure that the patient has that to take with them when they leave. Making sure there's a solid handoff process. A lot of near misses happen because of the lack of communication around what the risks are, what the observation level is, what the plan of care is. And again, thinking about those environmental safety checks. Here's another example of um, a, a ligature resistant room. You can see that the bed um, is not a traditional hospital bed. And again, we have a specialized windows. Um, the re the, they're also sloping. We have um, locked um, vent covers that, minis that minimize anchor points. So again, thinking about the lighting covers, um, the, these ones mitigate risk. They don't have the same self-harm um, opportunity for them. The beds, uh, the beds don't have frames. They're actually bed boxes. Um, Again, this is just more examples of being able to look at the, how the blinds are um, encased in the windows themselves. So we put bubbles, plastic bubbles, over things like emergency alarms, um, exit signs, those sorts of things. You can see the furniture looks very different. Most of it is sloping. We do not have drop ceilings anywhere in our environment. They're all solid ceilings. We, we use the uh, soft suicide doors. Um, they actually look like and can feel like um, uh, gym mats. Um, they have metal on the side that that's how they hold up, and there's no there's no wrist point so that if somebody tried to tie something off them, they literally do fall down. Um, you can see by the shower heads and the control knobs, all they all have a sloping face. They all have a sloping face to those as well. You can't really see that the grab bars are, in K are enclosed here, but they are. Um, again, we utilize the specialized sockets. We also use Norex furniture, which is rounded and doesn't have anchor points in our community areas. Um, exit signs are to the ceiling, so there's no ability to tie anything off around that. All of our windows have specialized steel casing to keep any opportunity for anything being um, broken or having any kind of um, ligature point because they're all continuous. We have cameras in all of our common areas, um, our recessed door handles, and then of course we utilize continuous hinges. Our fire extinguishers are in specialized containers so that they, so with a pretty heavy um, lectan on them. And we also encase our television so that there we takes away all the opportunity for the cords in the brackets behind them. We have safety mirrors that we utilize for being able to observe patients at all times. And all of our pictures have sloping edges and, safe, and safety screws so that they also cannot be utilized for um, potential ligature points. And all of our um, ceiling covers are ligature resistant as well, and our desks are wall mounted for, to prevent them being used as a weapon or to prevent them being able to stand on them, <clears throat> excuse me, and being able to, um, you know, access something. So you can see the mirrors on both sides, both sides in this particular unit. So this is the difference between a psychiatric unit that really has moved to being 100% ligature resistant 
um, to a medical hospital, which does not have to meet these particular um, expectations. And we also have door sensors that keep staff updated on uh, people who are entering and exiting rooms. We especially do this in our adolescent areas. And then we also have recess screens that allow for different kinds of things with calming imagery. This particular one that you're looking at is actually a, a, a fish tank. It's not a live fish tank, but if you didn't know it, you might think so when you first go in to see it. But it's, it's recessed and allows for our patients to really be able to look at that and find it as being a, a calming opportunity. So I think that's pretty much the end of my presentation. I hope that this was helpful. I am going to turn this back over to Kelly and uh, let her take it from here. Thanks, Carol. That concludes the slide presentation portion of our program. Now we'd like to begin our question and answer period. Carol, is there a screening tool that you would recommend? Um, yeah, I don't really recommend screening tools. I can tell you what we're doing. We use the Columbia um, uh, screening tool. Um, and, and it's got the, essentially it's three questions, and it op and then depending on the answers, it opens up um, additional questions. I think there's a total of six, but we are using the Columbia, and then our assessment is the Safe T, and we use that in all of our psychiatric areas. It's also the screening tool that is utilized in all of our medical. Thank you. Some additional questions. Why, why is there such a huge focus on risk assessments rather than maybe clinical decision making of staff caring for suicidal patients? Yeah, I think that's a great question, and I get asked that a lot. I think that, I think what's happened over time is that even with clinical decision making, um, they have found that the rise of patients in, in uh, psychiatric units and medical units have continued to, cr to climb in terms of suicide. And so looking at what are those areas where patients who've had, where it, those areas where um, suicide attempts or suicide completions have happened. And I think that's what's really led to it. I think clinical decision making certainly is still an important part. But making sure that the environment is safe has become a huge focus. And I certainly, I, I, at one point in time, I would, I would have said I didn't necessarily believe in that. I really thought clinical decision making would, would really trump because I am by, by trade a clinician but I've really come to value and respect the importance of what we can do by keeping our environment safe and by training folks around the risks that exist in an environment. I think we've really decreased the amount of near misses and attempts in our areas, in, meaning behavioral health, but I've also seen a decrease in, in medical for those folks who are really working hard at uh, keeping safe environments. And, and seeing your pictures that throughout the presentation were very helpful and I think really kind of um, drove home some of the things that we need to be aware of. But what if hospitals cannot make all those environmental changes? Yeah, many hospitals can't make them. It's very, very expensive. Um, so I think looking at what your mitigation plans are, I think is probably the most important part. If you're, if you're behavioral health, if you're a psychiatric hospital, you have to make some changes. There just is no opportunity to not, but you want to look at some things that are those low-hanging fruits, those pieces that can be done pretty quickly with, with minimal cost. Um, so things like um, thinking about the doorknobs and the door hinges, uh, believe me, out of all the costs to behavioral health, those are probably the cheapest. The other thing is lots of times in in hospitals, they have great facility folks who can create some things on their own. We have a great facilities department here. and One of the things that they do is if we can't find a product or we're not sure what we need, they make one for us. Um, and I, I think being able to utilize, you know, the expertise that you have within your hospitals to look at those pieces. But again, thinking about those mitigation plans. Um, thinking about, okay, I may not be able to make these changes this year, but what about my capital budget for next year? It may not still be able to happen, but what can I do, though, knowing that I need to keep our patients safe? So those patients who are most at risk for suicide really are those ones that you're going to want to do direct observation beyond that one-on-one. -on -one. Make sure you're providing the training and the education to the staff so that they are aware of what the issues are and how they can best also mitigate that risk. I can't say that enough. And then having the risk assessment, I think it really teaches everybody what it looks on the environment, what kind of things 
are opportunities for patients to do self-harm that we don't want them, you know, don't want them to engage in. So thinking about the risk assessment and mitigation for those hospitals that just can't make it, make those financial um, changes. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, this is going to be a two-part question. How often should risk assessments be completed? And then with that risk assessment, the tools, the checklist, whatever you're utilizing, is that part embedded into your electronic record? It's not embedded. So I'm, I'm going to answer the second part first. It's not embedded in our uh, electronic medical record, but it is something that we share with all of our staff. So when we do our environmental rounds and we do the do the risk assessment, that risk assessment then gets put into a PowerPoint that goes through all the potential risks that are in the unit, and we provide this education for all of our staff. It's a very active live document. That's true for our service line as well. Um, myself and the Director of Clinical Services do, do semi-annual um, risk assessments um, in all of our areas. And so we really encourage folks, and they are really on top of making sure that they're making that part of what they're doing, at least semi-annually. But here at Western Psych and all of our service lines, we actually do it much more frequently because we've, made it, we've actually added it into our daily rounding. Um, for teaching folks to identify those things that could be a potential risk. We do, um, you know, good catches all the time. And part of the good catches is about helping folks learn how to identify potential safety um, near misses, things that we can prevent from happening. So I think I kind of answered that all in one. Yeah, and I, and I like hearing about the good good catches. I mean, we're proponents of that as well, so that's great to hear. And then you have the frontline staff kind of working with you as well with all of this. Yeah, it really does go hand in hand. And one of the things I think is really important is, you know, in a medical hospital, thinking about, you know, uh, looking at the potential for having somebody with psychiatric with a psychiatric background, a behavioral health background, who really understands those risks, be a part of that team. And, you know, if you have that opportunity in your hospital, that's fantastic. Um, if you don't, there are lots of organizations, some good, some not so good out there, who can also help you with that. But I think sometimes adding that particular eye to what behavioral, you know, for looking at the behavioral health point of view can be really helpful. Can you recommend an education program or product for those trained for continuous or direct observation of uh, direct observation staff members? Wow, that's a great question. Um, so at UCMC, we have what's called a psychiatric, psychiatric care attendant training. Um, it was developed by us by Behavioral Health by here at Western Psych, and that's what we utilize. Um, you know across all the UPMC hospitals. I am not aware of a particular product. I would be happy to research that a little bit and share that with, um, you know, the Patient Safety Authority that maybe they can send that out. I would be happy to do that. But because we've had one that um, we've utilized for a long period of time that's been very effective in our training, I, I just can't think of another one in particular. It's a great question, though. Do you have um, separate patient care rounds for your behavioral health patients or include in general patient rounds? So it really depends on the risk level. Um, you know, again, that's part of that um, intervention for looking at patients who identify as a low, moderate, or high risk for suicide, and you know, adding into that, it wasn't particularly the conversation today, but also those patients um, who are elopement risks or those who are violent, um, violent behavior risks. Those patients, in particular, would probably be rounded more frequently than the general medical patient who may be on a unit. Um, some of those obviously are going to have to the one-on-one -on -one, um, direct observation. But I think for those, behave, those patients who are in there truly for a medical reason but may have a history of depression or anxiety, you probably are not going to round on them any more frequently than you would round on your regular medical patients. They're there for medical that, although they have a behavioral health history, doesn't mean that's part of what their actual care is at that point in time. So again, it's about the, it's about the evaluation of that patient and what they're, what they're really there for and what risks they may have that should determine that. 
Thank you. I have a few more questions here, uh, and it looks like we're still okay with time. How do you deal with survey variability? Uh, that's probably one of the worst things I experience all the time. Um, <clears throat> for me, you know, it's very frustrating when we work really hard and we go into a survey and, you know, the last time we had a survey, everything was great. We haven't really made any changes in process, but we get a different surveyor and they see things totally different. Um, here at our hospital and across our service line, I think for us it's really about making sure that we totally understand what the standards say. You know, whether in medical, you know, I, I oftentimes try to go to the Joint Commission surveys in our medical hospitals because I've had, you know, I have a lot of involvement with the EDs and be that person that can push back a little bit with the Joint Commission, you know, asking them. And I think it's a re reasonable question. Where is that in the standard? You know, because oftentimes it is interpretation. We've, we've asked them to take things up to the um, survey interpretation group when we've needed to because we did not feel that they were surveying it properly. Um, I think that know your processes, know the things that you put in place, make sure that, that you or those on your team are very comfortable with the Joint Commission standards and utilize those things to your strengths. That's what we really try to do here. Great, thank you for that information. What about the use of video monitoring for behavioral health patients? So video monitoring is not permitted for any patient who's been deemed as being at high risk for suicide. The only monitoring there is one-to-one, is -one, that direct observation. Uh, in hospitals that have video monitoring, it can be an intervention uh, for somebody who's at low risk for suicide. Um, depending on the patient who's been identified to be at moderate risk for suicide, maybe, maybe not. It depends on the, you know, the, the closeness of the person who's doing the monitoring. We, in some hospitals, you know, the monitoring happens on a totally different floor. Um, that immediate access can be that problem because it, when somebody's at high risk, at a moderate risk, um, you know, we don't know from one minute to the next what could change that to become a high risk. So I think that becomes part of that intervention, but it can be. Um, depending on how you put that into your policy for those at low or at a moderate risk, but never for a patient who's been deemed to be at high risk for suicide. Thank you, Carol. We're coming to the end of our hour, and do you have any maybe final words of wisdom? I, there was a lot of great information here. You shared a lot of great pictures to kind of emphasize some of the points you were making. Is there anything else you'd like to say in closing? Um, I think that I would just really, again, reinforce, you know, the, first of all, the screening and identification of those behavioral health patients who are most at risk for suicide, um, really doing the risk assessments. Again, it'll be your saving grace to have looked at your environment and really identified those things that are at risk for, for that behavioral health patient, whether it be in a medical or a psychiatric area. And then thinking about the, the mitigation plan, those things are going to go together hand in hand to really create that safe environment for behavioral health. It's very, very distressing to hear from folks where they've had either a near miss or a suicide completion in their ED or in a medical or in a psychiatric unit um, and recognize that there were things that perhaps could have been done that were not done. Training and education and awareness um, are also a huge piece. It's kind of like the icing on the cake in terms of keeping patients safe. Thank you very much. We appreciate everything that you've shared with us today. This concludes our webinar. Thank you.